Hello, this is the first in a series of lectures on uh, international water law. And in this first uh, lecture, I will introduce you to freshwater resources. I will explain its importance, but also outline the challenges that uh, we face when managing our freshwater resources. And I will explain briefly, but this will be elaborated uh, on in later lectures on the importance of uh, global governance and international law in the management and utilization of freshwater resources. So let's get started. I think um, one of the best ways to uh, show the importance of fresh water for our daily use is to uh, have a look at art. Yeah, because in a lot of pictures, a lot of paintings, uh, even those of the uh, uh, ages long gone, um, they feature freshwater resources, uh, clearly uh, outlining uh, their importance. And so if you look, for example, at this painting, it's a painting of a, a Dutch master uh, of some time ago, uh, and it shows the uh, cows that drink from a freshwater resource, uh, a little pond or lake. But the same thing you can see everywhere. So this is a, a painting from Japan, and here you see also a river as it features in uh, people's daily lives. And as you can see very clearly from this picture, um, a river or any freshwater resource has a kind of calming, soothing effect on people. Also in China, there's a lot of traditional paintings that feature very prominently a freshwater resource. And so all these paintings, traditional paintings of uh, people living uh, the rural lifestyle, uh, they show a freshwater resource and it can be used uh, to fish, uh, it can be used uh, for recreation, to navigate uh, from one village to the other, but it can also just be used to relax. Uh, so here in this last painting, uh, you'll see a, uh, a lonely man uh, contemplating probably about his life and he is overlooking, he's looking at the water. So it has this calming, uh, relaxing effect on him. So where is our fresh water? Where is our water uh, located? It's important to keep in mind that 98% uh, of the world's water is uh, situated in the ocean and in the seas. So it's salt water. And international water law, uh, the uh, topic of the lectures uh, does not concern itself with salt water. Yeah, so 98% of the world's water is not regulated by international water law and is not the topic of the present lectures. So only a tiny fraction of the world's water is uh, uh, governed by international water law. And of that tiny proportion, uh, the majority, uh, about 70%, is, exists in this world in the shape of glaciers or a permanent snow cover, uh, so in, in solidified frozen shape. Only about 30% um, of the 3% uh, of the world's fresh water we find in liquid form. And the majority of that liquid fresh water in the world is situated underground. Uh, so in aquifers uh, situated on the ground. So only about 0.5%, uh, uh, so about a half percent, uh, percent of the world's water, we find in the rivers and lakes that we normally associate with international water law. It's important to keep this in mind. So now that we know where we can find the world's fresh water, uh, the next question is, how do we use it and how much of it do we need? When you look at the uh, daily use of freshwater resources, it's important uh, to understand that there is a great uh, discrepancy, there's a great uh, differentiation in the amount of water, fresh water, uh, that is used for daily consumption to satisfy daily water needs. 
For example, if we look first at a family in uh, Malawi, uh, this family uh, uses about 120 liters of water a day. And these uh, bottles you see on the picture, they represent uh, this daily water need. Huh? So those are, that's 120 liters of water. So that's uh, an average family in Malawi. But then if we go to Myanmar, it's about 160 liters, so a little bit more. But if we go to New York, there the average daily water use is about 1,000 liters. Huh? Again, uh, nicely depicted in these, these bottles of water. Of course, it's not the dog huh, that consumes all this water. So there must be other reasons why people in the West consume so much more water or need so much more water than people in other parts of the world. Of course, they don't drink this water. So, for example, uh, the man is wearing jeans. It takes a lot of water to produce jeans. And there's all sorts of reasons why people in the West need more water, or maybe they don't need it, but they use more water than people in other parts of the world. Also important to keep in mind is that, okay, maybe it feels a bit unfair yeah, that some parts of the world use so much more water than others. But uh, you should not see uh, the world's fresh water as a giant pie, uh, uh, that each person takes one slice of the pie. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so the people in New York, they draw from a different source of fresh water than people um, in uh, Bolivia or in Malawi. So if uh, less water would be made available to the people in New York, it doesn't mean more water would be available to people elsewhere in the world. It doesn't, it's not that simple. Also important to keep in mind is that about 80% of the world's fresh water is used in agriculture, as so to irrigate crops, and certain crops are more thirsty than others. And so choice of crops is also very important. And so only a about 15-20% of the world's uh, fresh water is used for daily consumption by uh, people. So what about the law? Uh, what, uh, does, uh, what role does uh, the law play when it comes to fresh water management and use? Well, the, the key concept I would uh, propose is water security. Uh, this nicely encapsulates the essence of uh, freshwater governance and freshwater needs. But this concept of water security uh, has um, been translated in different ways, has taken different shapes depending on the international legal framework in, in which it is used. So I now give an overview of uh, the international legal frameworks that are used uh, to regulate issues relating to freshwater use. For example, international human rights law. If we look at the right of individuals of access to water to meet their uh, daily needs, uh, for drinking water, for sanitation purposes, um, we refer to the human right to water. So then water security is translated into a human right to water. And then it takes on the shape of a human right. But we can also see it as a people's right. So peoples have a right to self-determination, to freely determine their own future, but also to freely dispose of their own freshwater resources, like any other of their natural resources. So then water security is part of the right to development, the right to self-determination. It's an aspect of that right, that people's right. You can also approach water security from the lens of international water law. And then international water law could be seen as a sub-discipline of international environmental law. So international environmental law, one of the key principles is the obligation uh, not to cause harm or to cause significant harm to other states when uh, using natural resources. So this principle, the no harm principle, also applies to transboundary uh, water courses and other uh, transboundary water resources. 
So states are under an obligation uh, to use uh, their freshwater resources in such a way that they do not cause significant harm to another state that makes use of the same freshwater resource. Think of a lake or a river that is shared with uh, more than one state, uh, like the Mekong River, uh, the Rhine in Europe, the Danube, or the Nile in Africa. So then you approach water security from the perspective of international water law as a sub-discipline of international environmental law. You can also look at water security as in, from the perspective of intergenerational law. So what is intergenerational law about? It's about the relation between the current generation and the future generation. So then the key question is, uh, what do we owe uh, as a present generation? What do we owe to the unborn, to future generations? Uh, so to people that do not yet exist. What obligations do we have vis-a-vis -vis people who do not yet exist? And of course, because they don't exist, they cannot claim or vindicate these rights. Uh, so maybe we owe them something, uh, we have obligations towards them, but they don't have corresponding rights. These corresponding rights, uh, they will only get once they come into existence. Uh, so this is intergenerational law. It's a subdiscipline of international law that is only sort of gaining ground in, in recent times. So we can see uh, water security as an intergenerational issue. Finally, we can also approach it from the lens of uh, disaster law, international disaster law. And so uh, a lot of um, disasters have a bearing or have a relationship with uh, water. Think of floods, but also droughts. And there's this uh, subfield of international uh, law called uh, international disaster law, which is also uh, developing uh, in recent years. And of course, uh, a major aspect of international disaster law is how to deal with floods. Yeah, what kind of responsibility is engaged and what kind of response can we expect of states in case of floods? So the three main challenges when it comes to freshwater management are too much water, too little water and polluted water. So uh, this I take from uh, research done by Lichtfoot and colleagues in 2018. And so there can be too little water, then we suffer from water scarcity. Uh, there could be dirty water or contaminated water. Uh, this is an issue of pollution. Or there could be, incidentally, too much water, uh, a case of floods, international disasters. So let's look at each of those uh, in turn. If we look first at uh, water scarcity, a uh, lack of uh, water, it's crucial to appreciate the extent of this problem. And so a lack of access to clean drinking water and lack of sanitation are two of the major causes of human illness and mortality in this world. A lot of people die of uh, co cholera and uh, other diseases related to water shortages. And Africa has the highest annual deaths uh, relating to water scarcity, especially in Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, but numbers are also high in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, especially India uh, suffers from uh, droughts and water scarcity. Water pollution is also a big issue. Huh? Contaminated um, rivers, con contaminated groundwater. And so if a lot of pesticides are used in agriculture, then these pesticides may seep into the ground and eventually reach those aquifers, those underground reserves of fresh water. And some of these reserves are fossil water. So those are reserves that do not replenish. And other underground resources, they do replenish. Eh? So rainwater seeps into the ground and then refills such aquifers. Eh, but both of those resources, uh, eh, fossil ones and replenishable ones, um, they can be contaminated, they can be polluted. Eh? We can no longer draw from them to get our drinking water. Another a final problem is too much water, eh? floods. 
So this is a, a very persistent problem in, in certain parts of, uh, of Asia, uh, especially, um, but it could affect any part of the world, uh, rivers that over flood. And of course, there are ways to uh, manage and to control uh, the, the flow of a river. A dam could, uh, could do so. Um, and so you might wonder if states are under an obligation uh, to uh, undertake efforts to better manage uh, rivers, uh, to better contain them in case of extreme weather events such as droughts, but also uh, floods. So to conclude, I gave an overview of uh, the importance of fresh water and also the main challenges we face in the uh, utilization and management of fresh water. Uh, I already briefly introduced the international legal frameworks that can be applicable, that can be of assistance in regulating fresh water use. And I will further elaborate on uh, the international legal frameworks. And my focus will be on two, eh? international water law, but I will also say a few things about international human rights law in one specific lecture, uh, thereby focusing on human right to water.